just so you know, we're not just, uh, we're killing a little few minutes because we're not going to start for another four minutes. Give everybody time to log on. And uh, John is here representing Juniper today. Ms. Cindy is our sponsor today, ACPLM. How's everybody's weeks going? We've only got one day left. Jared, is there a trade show today? Did I misread that? And how did I miss that? I thought I saw you post something about a trade show. He said, yes, there is. Um, uh, it's a CAI. Oh, it's a mini. Is it, is it Orlando or, or Suncoast or? Jared, the man in the know. He is the man in the know. It's the Suncoast at the Marriott Hotel over oh, in uh, okay. St. So Pete, Clearwater, whatever area. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, we came here. We came to you instead of that trade show. No, Well, this is just way more convenient, right? <laughs> well, not just that, but, you know, we like to support all of your efforts and we appreciate what you're doing. So, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, um, I'm working on um, something I guess I can introduce now since I'm going to already do it. Um, I've been working on a trade show. Have I said anything to that about you guys? It's going to be a virtual online platform. And it's going to be for board members and community association unit owners. Mm. And, of course, managers can come in as well. But the whole point is to bridge the gap between unit owners and uh, board members and kind of educate everybody at the same time. And hopefully, um, we'll, you know, we might actually be able to help communities um, get some more volunteers involved when they learn more about what they can do in their community and stuff. So it's going to be a nice little expo. It's 24-7, 365, online. And um, I hope I'm trying to roll it out before the end of the year. So I think that um, I'm thinking it's going to be something that the management companies are really going to like because I'm going to ask the management companies to do the board certs on here. So uh, as soon as I get finished with what I'm doing on it, I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'm, I'm towards that the sounds end interesting. Of you know, you just can't ever give too much education to the board members and also to the unit owners. You know, that's it's just such a big learning curve for everyone that, you know, you would think that common sense would prevail a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to. Yeah, I, I and and the thing is, is I just think that right now, even with everything the way it is, and well, there's a lot of people that won't go out to a trade show, but they they might come online and just, you know, mosey around through there and meet some of the exhibitors. And when they need something, they'll be able to find it. It's the same kind of setup as Cam Matrix in a way where it's by topic. So you can find, you know, asphalt, landscape, whatever it is you're looking for. And um, it'll take you to their booth as well. So we do constantly do education on there. And the beauty in it is, is that we don't have to have sort of like, well, you know, the board search would be done by the management companies, but we don't have to provide CU courses on there. So every week, twice a week even, we could have our ex exhibitors doing educational sessions on their products and their, you know, the, the process of what it takes to do what you do, you know? And I think that that's the kind of stuff that there's never enough, there's never enough time to talk about it. And they kind of will give it a platform, not only to help the managers, but also help the board members. So that's great. All right, guys. Well, we are at the 12.05 mark, so I do believe it is time to let Cindy tell us a little bit about ACPLM, who is sponsoring today's virtual online CEU course. Hi. So good afternoon. I'm Cindy from ACPLM. We are a full-service asphalt and concrete company. We service the state of Florida. And basically anything, you know, that you might need from seal coating, small pothole repairs, a total mill and pave, um, curbing, sidewalks, ADA issues. And now, of course, we're entering the rainy season. So if you have any sort of ponding water or your catch basins are not working or flowing properly, you know, we can help you with all of those things as well. So we're here to be a good partner for you, a good resource. We invite you to pick our brains. I know your budgeting time is coming up. So if you need some bids and information for your budgets, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and give me a call. We'd love to have an opportunity to bid your work. What were you saying earlier, Cindy, about what you're kind of telling everybody to expect this year as far as with gas prices being higher and uh, labor costs and everything? So when we're doing our budget uh, bids for our customers, what we're saying is you should 
add about 15% to that bottom number. Uh, if you don't need it, that's great because you have it there. But if you do need it, you know, then you don't have to take the money from some other project to make this one, you know, work or put this one off for another year. Because we all know as you delay work that's needed, it doesn't get cheaper over time. You know, your issues with sub base and asphalt issues will continue to deteriorate. And of course, that increases your liability and increases the amount of money it's going to take to get it right when we when when the board does finally approve it. So, you know, if you add that 15 percent, I think you'll be in good shape for your budgets when the board decides to pull the trigger on things. And like I said, if you don't need it, you don't have to spend it. And I am going to do a quick slide out and show Miss Cindy. Her contact information is right there on the left side of your screen. You should see it. You click that button, it'll take you to her um, connection in Camp Matrix. You can send her a message. And that'll stay up. You can even if you uncheck this box over to the bottom left, it'll still stay up on the top of our chat window. So you'll be able to go to her later if you'd like to. Thank you so much, Cindy, for uh, sponsoring today. We really appreciate it. And my um, pleasure. Appreciate you supporting manager education through Cam Matrix. Our pleasure. Happy to do it. And we'll have a gift card giveaway later today, and I'll um, I'm going to do that after the, the CEU class and we'll, I'll be emailing Miss Cindy with your contact information of the winner. Sounds great. Thank you. Bye Cindy. Bye. All right. Now we have John Daughtry who is representing on behalf of Juniper today. And everybody, if you don't know John, John's been around in the landscaping industry for years and years. He's an old fogey. <laughs> it's starting to feel that way after two decades. I think I think he's younger than I am, actually. Um, but I'm going to pass the torch over to John and let him present his course today. I think you're all going to find it very interesting because he's always a great presenter. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm representing Juniper today. Uh, they had a fallout with uh, one of their instructors, so they asked if I would step in and do it. So, of course, I said I would. Um, but if you do need anything from Juniper, uh, please reach out to Bonnie Marshall. Uh, over at Juniper. Here's her contact in information. I don't have anything quite as cool as Carrie does with all those awesome slide outs. Uh, so if you need anything, please reach out to Bonnie Marshall. She'll be happy to get you taken care of. A little bit about me. Um, I have been doing this for over 20 years, working with uh, condominiums and homeowner associations, uh, well over 20 years in the green industry, 10 years member of CAI, five years I sat on the Central Florida board, um, I've been a certified arborist since 2005, a horticultural professional since 2000, and a landscape certified contractor since 2001. And I still even have my association manager license from 2015, which you guys have the most ungrateful job there is. Uh, so hopefully you'll enjoy this class. And then my favorite color is green. So if you ever want to buy me something nice, I like the color green, just in case. You never know. So... What we're going to do today, we're going to talk about planting principles and plant ID. Planting principles, uh, some of those guidelines that we're going to be reviewing are from Dr. Ed Gilman, who retired from UF, is kind of like the planting god for us in the green industry. Uh, some pretty basic stuff, but we're going to go over knowing your site, which is very important because they're all a little bit different, uh, plant spacing and some safety concerns, and then also plant installation principles. That's where we'll kind of go over the guidelines from Dr. Ed Gilman. And then plant identification, my favorite part, we'll talk about some plants, what they look like, what they're good for, what they're not good for, things like that. And last, we're going to talk about holly trees. Um, if you like holly trees, I suggest you plug your ears on that because I'm not a huge fan. And I'm just going to state that from the beginning so you know, so you're not surprised. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. So first thing is knowing your site. What type of soil type do you have? You know, Florida ranges so much. You know, if you're up in the Claremont area and stuff like that, where you have really sandy soils, uh, you can also go down south and have sandy soil, but it's not nearly as well drained as you have in some, you know, Calen, stuff like that. So really understanding the soils and, you know, the soils will lead to the next one, which is how well does your site drain? You know, we see something like this and we go, well, clearly it doesn't drain out of that area, right? It's basically a swamp. But... We have areas like this. This was a project that Juniper did out in KCK. And 
the area we're looking at directly in front of us from in front of those palm trees, that area would flood consistently with water. And the reason being is the movement of water, even though it's on sandy soil, it's, it's on a key, for goodness sakes, it's all sand. When the volume of water from rain would come with the sidewalk that was put in there, which is all crushed shell, because of that compact soil, it would trap the water between the compact soil and the intercoastal there and on the other side. So we had to put in French drains and other things to move that water. But just because something doesn't have good drainage, it might not look like that swamp it did in the beginning. You can have areas like this that can have major drainage issues due to you know, walkways, things like that, that impede the flow of water. Uh, planting in full sun, do it unless plants like shade. Uh, full sun is gonna, where you're gonna have most of your flowering plants and things like that. There's very few plants that actually uh, bloom in shade, you know, like typically your tipachinas and stuff will do fairly well in there. But if you're planting a uh, shade plant in full sun, obviously it will burn. Uh, but if you're planting a full sun plant like a hibiscus in shade, they tend to get scragglier and, you know, as they're reaching for that light, you're not going to get the full use of the plant. Um, Home Depot and Lowe's, I always love to tell people they have a little tag on there and that will tell you what it is. And I'll give you some, also some tools at the end of this that you can kind of research and see what plants needs are. Uh, shade, you know, planting in shade, a lot of times we see like in this picture, there's turf areas. I definitely prefer having shrubs or ornamentals in shade areas because generally they have, you know, nice broad leaves to capture as much light as possible. Um, you can get lots of color in them from, you know, copper leaves and crotons and things like that, Thai plants. They're also generally in protected areas, so that foliage is a little bit nicer. And one thing with shade, the darker the shade normally, the wider the leaf gets, but thinner. So you'll actually get a larger leaf because it's trying to capture as much sunlight as possible. Um, so generally, that's what I like to suggest is putting in foliage plants in these types of areas. Uh, knowing your zone uh, and what to plant where. You know, in Florida, we have quite a few different zones. If you take it all the way from Tallahassee down to the Keys, you're gonna get a completely different profile. Orlando in Central Florida, we have about 10 plants that we see on every single property because we get hot, but we also tend to get some freezes. But then you have you know, your Tampa, Sarasota, and Fort Myers and Naples area where you can get away with a little bit more tropicals where you can have coconut palms and royal palms and you don't have as much threat of hard freezes. Um, you know, Orlando, we have had some years where we've had four or five hard freezes, which has knocked back quite a bit of our plant material. One tip with that, um, if you do ever get a hard freeze, don't cut off the material of the plant immediately. Uh, leave it on, and a lot of people say, well, it looks bad. Well, that material being damaged on top is actually insulating the rest of the plant. If you cut it down and you remove all that uh, dead material, and you get another freeze, it's just gonna damage the plant further. Because um, I've worked with a lot of HOAs that are like, well, we wanna cut it off immediately. Like, well, we have six, eight weeks of possible winter, well, Florida winter left. You know, we could do more damage to the plant, actually end up having to replace it instead of just having to cut it back. If you don't know what zone you're in, just Google it. It's kind of like the government when we were searching for COVID test sites, they just said, Google it, you'll find it. Same thing with your hardiness zone. Um, if you're in doubt of where you're at, just Google it and I'll tell you. Uh, plant spacing. You know, this is the general rule of thumb. This is not how builders plant plants because they want to sell the house and they want it to look full. But if you're planting a normal three gallon plant, you would plant it at three to three and a half feet apart. Normally what you're seeing in HOA and builder sites is probably something closer to 20 to 24 inches apart uh, on three gallon material. And then on one gallon material, you're probably gonna be one at nine to 18 inches. And it's gonna depend on the type of plant material really. Uh, some plant material like jasmine spreads really fast. Uh, you have some other like um, the Green Island ficus that you probably want a little bit closer together because it doesn't grow too fast. Perennial peanut, you probably want faster. So it you know fills in nice, but a general rule of thumb for healthy planting is a uh, three to three and a half feet on three gallon and nine inches to 18 inches on one gallon plants. Now, plant spacing, 
this is something that, you know, working at Juniper was great because you got to see how the designers worked it and whatnot. But just like with irrigation, there's square spacing and triangular spacing and circular spacing. With this, plant spacing is not all equal. If you do square spacing, like over on the left, you're going to have 32 plants. If you do triangular spacing on the right, you only need 26 plants, you know, and they're not as close to the edge and you kind of get a little bit more buffer. Um, and you're saving not only on plant material, but you're also getting more of a natural shape. If you look at the shape to the right, when that grows in, it's going to have a curve to the edge of it, you know, look a little bit nicer. Um, the one on the left there is going to be a strong square, which can, you know, some people want that really hedge look, but the uh, triangular spacing will give you the best look. And see, it does because that guy agrees. So clearly that's right. Um, this is what we see a lot of when we talk about that rule of plant material being 36 inches apart. Um, and depending on the variety, some of them will even be up to 60 inches apart, five feet apart. Um, now, when we see a sidewalk, it's normally we see the one on the top there is we're gonna have plants planted as close as possible. So they're barely touching each other. So it looks nice and full in the beginning, right? And then, you know, the next one we might see well, we just took one out of it and they're kind of close together. The bottom one really being only three plants looks sparse, but when it grows in, it's actually the right size. And we see this all the time in our HOAs when dealing with sidewalks and people getting into their town homes or condos or any, or even their homes that are maintained by the association. We're constantly cutting so far back into the plant material along the sidewalk and starts to look woody and bad. Um, in common areas, that can be a huge issue as it starts sticking out farther on the sidewalk. People actually run into it. Um, people can rip their grocery bags, you know, if they don't use their garage coming in, things like that. One thing that I will say, and this is something to keep in mind, and I've seen it happen and it's not a fun situation, is ornamental grasses that are too close to sidewalks, really planted like right up against it, can be major tripping hazards. If you consider it, if a grass is not pruned regularly, and I mean like every few weeks that's along the sidewalk. Uh, we had one community where a resident was walking on their phone, not looking down, and the grass had come over the sidewalk, one of those large Fakahatchee grasses. Well, the resident had stepped on the far right side with her foot, and then that pinned the grass down, and when she caught it with her left foot, she tripped and busted her head on the sidewalk. Um, so if you do have ornamental grasses, I will say during your property inspections and walks, be clear with the landscaper that the expectation is to keep these grasses off of the sidewalks. Um, luckily, you know, she was not hurt and she was fine, just a little bit embarrassed, but those situations can be really bad for associations managers because it's not something that you can really prevent. You can guide it and look at it, but it's not something you did, but then you have to deal with it. And we all know it ends up with the association manager at the end anyways. So maybe save you a little bit of headaches. Uh, insulation of shrubs. Here's a basic diagram. You'll notice that, you know, it's. John. Yeah. I had a quick question. I wanted to say, sure. too, we always, it's like a sore spot with me because the developers always put the trees where they look really nice when they're trying to sell the homes. But when the trees get bigger, they're too close to the sidewalk and they're breaking up the sidewalk or they're too close to the building and they're got to be trimmed constantly and. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, Jared asked about what type of sod works best in the shaded areas. Yeah, so when it comes to the builders, I know people like to gang up on them. One thing you have to realize, the builders, too, have code minimums in types of trees they have to use by the county. So some of that is also on county regulations. You know, the, there's a little bit back and forth on that, what they get points for, and it's a little bit more complicated on that end. Uh, for shade turf, there's all sorts of shade turf that is a floor tame or St. Augustine variety, like your bitter blues and palmettos. Uh, those are generally the best for it. Uh, that's what I would suggest. Your bahayas are going to be really thin, and even your zoysias are going to thin out a lot faster than those. Sherry wants to know, she said, we have an Indian hawthorn. Well, we have Indian hawthorn all over the community, and it's dying everywhere. It is the original plant yeah. material, so it's 30 plus years old. 
what is a good replacement for it? It's used around the pools for privacy and other hedges. So people hate the word ficus, but Green Island ficus is a slower growing ficus, has a beautiful emerald colored leaf to it, grows fairly slow, and it is a great replacement for Indian hawthorn. And it's just about bulletproof. Doesn't get a lot of pests, can take wind, can take rain, can take salt. It's, it's really nice. Thank you. No problem. Um, so yeah, when planting shrubs, one thing you'll notice here is, you know, it's the bottom is the existing, you're resting the plant on the existing soil. Uh, and the reason that is, or recompacted, is because you don't want the plant to sink. Uh, the one of the worst things you can have for plants is that they're planted too deep. When they are planted too deep, it takes, you know, years sometimes for them to decline. But as they do, they end up, you know, declining and dying. And the other thing is, you know, you can kind of see like the little uh, well that's planted around it. That's generally for some larger shrubs, uh, but realize that generally ends up on top of the shrub, um, the root ball there. So then you look at trellises, you'd be shocked. I think this is common sense. And when I show people it's common sense, but when you've seen some people plant things, it's not common sense. Um, so if you do have a trellis and you're installing it, you want the pot to go vertically. Uh, you don't want to plant it at the angle that you're putting in the trellis because you can tilt the trellis back and attach it to the wall. You don't have to plant the pot um, at that angle. And I think that's an important distinction. You'd be surprised what we've seen people plant, you know, 20% of the root ball on the right side is poking out of the ground because they planted it at an angle, but you can just move those over pretty easy. Here's the big one for me. Ins insulation of larger shrubs, and I should have put on here, and trees, right? especially in Florida, having 10% of the root ball above the grade. And that's such a vitally important thing because as the mulch and the tree well get filled in, the last thing you want to have on your trees, especially, you know, your hardwood trees and palm trees, is them being planted too deep. You know, there's some instances where I've seen them plant as much as 15% above uh, the grade because of water conditions and things like that. So if you are having an installation done, which is gonna be the most expensive, are gonna be your trees, large shrub material, and palms, is just check and make sure that that root ball is not buried too deep. At worst, it should be level with the um, existing, with the existing grade that's there. At best, it should be above it, and I would say 10% or so above that grade. And it might look a little bit funny sticking out there, but as it gets covered with mulch, it'll be fine. Um, but that, that'll that save you a lot of headaches in the future. Uh, irrigation for pots, they're great. Uh, this was actually a project years ago. I got asked to go uh, looking at some crepe myrtles for somebody, and we were looking at this pot installation. Um, as we were going through it, you know, they wanted to put in some like flax oil or something, was giving them suggestions on what he could use. What was interesting is, the this is the water line that went into the uh, pot there and you can see from the first row like it's pretty simple it goes up to the top you attach a bubbler to it it's going to work right and it's half inch uh, flex pipe what was interesting was this when we pulled on it, it wasn't attached so the person doing the installation to basically check it off his list was just putting a pipe in there so when it was inspected it showed that it was attached um, clearly it was not and you know we had some discussions and got that taken care of uh, but it's also important anytime you're doing anything on pool decks and things like that inspect the irrigation before things get buried you know i think it's a vitally important thing to do because could you imagine if they did plug that in and now you have water rushing under a monument you know, wouldn't show up for months or maybe even a year till it, you know, uh, degraded enough soil to make the monument fail. So ornamentals. Here's one that you should know and we see everywhere. This is Viburnum suspensum. Um, it's one of the Viburnums that is, has the darker green leaf. This is one of my favorite for AC units and things like that and even uh, shrub material. It has a nice green, uh, nice green leaf to it, pretty bulletproof. Uh, what we see a lot is its cousin, Viburnum odoratissum. You can see it has a larger leaf and a little bit lighter color. These ones around ACs too, 
if you have a larger area, I, gen I suggest using these, but these around your AC units grow so fast and leave so large, they generally um, block the air more than the viburnum suspensum. So if you have a smaller area, use suspensum. If it's larger, use odoratissum. Uh, some more on those. Uh, for those folks on the coast, silver buttonwood can be a great shrub. It doesn't like to be hedged too much, but if you can have it in an area where you're cutting it back every so often and it's very salt tolerant and it has a nice gray color to it, almost like a lamb's ear. And then cocoa plum. Cocoa plum is one of those we use a lot over in Southwest Florida. I actually had an interesting uh, text today. Someone said, well, someone wants to plant a papaya tree and it has fruit. And I told them, no, because you can't plant fruit trees. And they go, well, cocoa plums have fruit. And it's true, they do have fruits, but remember they're being hedged all the time. So that means those fruits are generally being cut off or the buds are being cut off before they ever produce fruit. But I, that lady really wanted a papaya tree. Uh, how you use plants, you know, we have these townhome frontages. There's so many different things you could do. You could just use, you know, some mock gardenias with jet, uh, juniper. You could also use flax lily with viburnum suspensum. You could use viburnum suspensum and a couple podocarpus and some Mexican heather. You know, there's so many different ways, like same area, but so many things that you could do different with the townhome community and those fronts. And, you know, you can vary them by the different uh, model types and stuff like that. Confederate jasmine, one of my favorite ground covers. A lot of people use it as a vine to, you know, go up walls and things like that. It actually makes a great ground cover, especially in like parking lot islands and things like that, where you don't want to have mowers going around cars and stuff like that, but you want a nice, you know, clean green appearance. Also, I've seen mixed in with those, especially down in South Florida, like just tossing in a couple Thai plants in there because you get a nice uh, bounce of purple color or even having strips of um, flax lily, like kind of in an S formation throughout it. Those are some nice add-ins with your jasmine beds. There's also dwarf varieties. If you have smaller areas, realize dwarf, these will grow a lot slower. Confederate jasmine will be able to take over bed pretty quickly. If you're using any of these dwarf varieties like the variegated or the green, you're gonna to have to have a pretty good uh, weed control protocol or plant them very, very close together. Uh, because one thing is there's gonna be some space in between them and you're gonna to have to water them quite a bit to get them established. Not only do new plants love that, but weeds love that. Uh, blue days. It's one of the underrated plants because I think it's planted a lot of times in wet areas and it does not like having wet feet, but this is actually an elevated bed over in Epcot and it has done amazingly well. Um, so sometimes for your pots, planter areas, things like that, that don't get overly saturated, I think Blue Days is a great uh, plant and ground cover to use. And you can see they kind of used it in combination with uh, junipers and liriope and some, it looks like gold dust crotons back there. Canna lilies, you know, they're messy, but I kind of call them, like, they're back 40 pretty, right? So if you have, like, a wall area of a community that's, like, on the other side of a lake or farther away from people where they can't see some of the dead flowers on the canna lilies, you know, planting those kind of in areas where People can see them when they bloom and when they're not, you just cut them all back and let them grow again. You know, I wouldn't put them up at the front door of a clubhouse, um, but they really do well in the colors on this is actually downtown Winter Garden. I snapped a photo of these. I thought the yellow was absolutely great. And, you know, where else are you going to get that kind of color from? And it's a pretty bulletproof plant. You know, you cut them back every so often, they keep regrowing. Copper leaf. Again, this is one of those plants that uh, we're starting to see used a lot more along entry walls and community buffer areas. You know, if you use in the back and use something maybe green in the front of it, you can let these grow up to four or five feet and get some really nice color. They do really good in shade, a pretty versatile plant and copper leaf comes in multiple types of cultivars where you can have anything from your standard one there on the left, or they have some really unique ones on the right there with cultivars where the leaves curve and maybe have more of a serrated edge to them. Uh, one I don't see a lot, you know, we talked about Indian hawthorn um, and, you know, those declining after 30 years. 
This is one I don't see a whole lot anymore, but they're still around. It's called a Majestic Beauty. It's basically the big brother to the Indian Hawthorn. They're, they're kind of like orchids, right? If you have an orchid and you pay too much attention to it, they generally die. But if you pay just the right amount of not attention to an orchid, they seem to do well. You can tell these are pretty hardy too. If you look where they're planted, they're parked, they're next to two, you know, concrete walls basically. And it's in a, you know, there's a lot of radiant heat and all sorts of other things and they're doing really well. Um, they're actually ornamental trees that do pretty good. Um, I like them better than Jatrofas. I, I think they do better. And, you know, since it's related to Indian Hawthorn, the color is pretty neutral. Knockout Roses. These were all the rage five, six years ago. And now those of us that have them on their property are dealing with thrip issues and things like that. Uh, roses are good and they can be good on your property. But just remember, you're going to have to adjust your fertilization specs for those, right? You're going to want to have those fertilized at least every other month to keep them looking good. And the other thing you're going to want to use with knockout roses is you're going to want to use a systemic insecticide on them to keep the thrips from, you know, causing the leaves to deform and buds to fall off and stuff like that. Um, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I think it's conserve is what is one of the best to use on those, especially with chili thrips and whatnot. Crotons. Uh, some people do not like crotons. I like crotons quite a bit. Oops. Um, I like crotons quite a bit, uh, especially the gold dust there on the top left. I think that color's great. Uh, they're pretty bulletproof when you plant them places. Uh, don't like wet feet. The petras on the right, they drop a little bit too many leaves. I'm a maintenance person. I don't like a lot of dropping leaves. Uh, but there's so many different varieties, like the mammy crotons, which kind of look like a corkscrew. I think they can be used in landscapes effectively, you know, and around clubhouses pretty well. And they can tolerate shade. And you can even get those that are grown in the full sun. Thai plants. You know, there's so many different types of Thai plants now. You know, there's um, the Black Magic Thai up on the top left there. Those do really, really well. And then, of course, our classic Hawaiian Thais. And there's all sorts of other varieties of them. What's nice is if you do have these and they get burned in a freeze, you can cut them back and they grow right back. You know, they rejuvenate themselves. They can be a really good staple <clears throat> as an accent for your community. Arbicola we see everywhere. Uh, just do know there's a few different varieties. There's variegated in the green. And even within that variegated, there's multiple cultivars within that. Um, so there's all sorts of trinettes, and then I think there's an even more yellow one. So just make sure you understand which one you're getting, because uh, some are more yellow than the others. Pink muley grass. Hey, if you're going to have an ornamental grass, why not have one that is pink once in a while? I mean, it, ornamental grasses aren't known for being the most beautiful things. I think pink muley grass is better than red fountain grass. Red fountain grass is really nice when you install it. But generally, after 18 months and a few cutbacks, they don't tend to have that same pop to them and you get a little bit more dieback on them. I think pink muley grass is one of the best options uh, for having an ornamental grass that looks really, really nice. Here's that Green Island ficus I was talking about. Um, this is one of my favorite plants. It has a tropical look to it. The leaf is really nice. It, it kind of has that shininess to it. I think it's a great plant and it, you know, unlike other ficus that grow like a weed, this one grows well, but it's not going to grow to the point like you're cutting it out of, you know, all your other plants. You know, it doesn't grow like a jasmine or things like that. And it just has such a nice leaf to it, almost has a succulent like look to it, but it, due to having that thicker leaf and whatnot, it's not really prone to many pests either. And to me, that's a win-win, a good looking plant that, you know, can replace Indian hawthorn. It doesn't have a lot of pests, it's tops in my book. A wax myrtle. Generally, people who know what wax myrtle is have done something in a native area that they shouldn't have. Um, wax myrtle is one of our native shrub materials that we use to fill in for certain types of plants, um, you know, and replacements and mitigation. They can be decent trees. Just as they get larger, they tend to be brittle. They do not make good shrub material, even though the ones on the right there. I've seen people try to make those into shrubs. After about four or five years, they kind of just green on the top and leggy at the bottom. But uh, they do make uh, good replacements when you need them. 
Firebush. Okay. So make sure when you get Firebush, it's a great plant, blooms orange, a lot of people like it. But there's a regular and there's a dwarf. The regular I have seen grow 15 feet tall. And in a short period of time, I've seen it eight feet tall. So you'll know whether you have the regular or the dwarf. One, the leaf size on the regular will be larger. But a lot of times when they come in three gallon material, they look very similar. So make sure you're looking at the leaf size when you get them. And if you see that it's growing faster than normal, if you plant one of those in summer, trust me, if you plant the regular, you're going to notice greatly um, how fast it's growing in like six, eight weeks opposed to the dwarf. So just make sure if you do get it, get the dwarf and make it clear to your uh, landscape provider that you want the dwarf, unless you want something that gigantic, but the uh, regular firebush grows quite, quite quick. Agathanthus, this is another one of those I kind of like on the other side of a pool enclosure or you know on the other side of the pool fence, maybe 10, 15 feet away. I think it's a beautiful plant. When it blooms, it's stunning. And when it's not, it can be nice and green. Uh, you just don't want to keep it super wet. Uh, they gen generally will tend to get uh, real yellow leaves and tip die back and look a little rough, but I think they're a great plant that you can use in the in HOAs and associations. Dwarf oleander, we're seeing it quite a bit. Um, it's a nice plant. It does tend to get caterpillars, and the caterpillars you know, won't kill the plant, but they will defoliate it. And a lot of times by the time you come and spray it, they're pretty much already gone or you know you don't want to spray because they're going to turn into um, moths later and some people like to keep them um, but it's a pretty versatile plant I don't like to put them around pool areas or anything with um, people just because you know oleanders uh, can be poisonous so I try to keep those generally away but they are a pretty plant one of my favorite plants and most versatile plants is the Chinese fan palm so you can buy it on the one on the left like Saw palmettos, the native saw palmettos, if you ever have to replace an area of those, my goodness, is it expensive. But if you kind of want that look in an island in one of the communities or whatnot, you can just use Chinese fan palms. And then as they grow up, they become the palm on the right. You know, it might take 15 years, but, you know, you can go from having a nice little palmetto green tropical area to having some nice palms that have grown up in its place. Uh, but they're a really, really great palm. And uh, just so you know, this is not a triple on the left there. That's just three palms planted in one, one container there. So we all know these sago palms. They are a staple. Most of them, we lost quite a few of them to the CICAD scale, uh, what, in the mid-1996 to like 2005, 2008. We lost quite a few of them to CICAD scale. Uh, one thing to know about it is these seed pods. This is the female uh, sago palm. These seed pods are especially poisonous. Um, I do say if you see them laying around, things like that, uh, for some reason, dogs and cats love to get them, especially dogs, um, and they might not know any better. So just kind of keep an eye out. And it's something to, good to educate people on. They're located in the middle of the palm, so they're not easily accessible and, you know, it's hard to get them, but sometimes they fall out. And when they do, dogs will pick them up and sometimes get sick. Um, so it's just something to keep. If you have a sago palm and you have a dog, maybe just keep them an eye on them that he or she isn't, you know, rooting around the bottom of the sago palm when they are blooming like that. European fan palms, one of my favorite little palms, it doesn't grow really fast. I think it has a great shape to it. It also has thorns, so you put them around hot tubs and it keeps everybody away. It's great. It's a very, very versatile tree. Um, I like them quite a bit. They do tend to get scale, but nothing that can't be treated real easily. Um, so you don't see them used a whole lot more anymore, but it's one of my favorites instead of, you know, we see pygmy, pygmy date palms absolutely everywhere. Variegated oleander. Um, it's not widely available yet, but you know, this is a really cool looking plant because not only do you get the flowers on it because it's an oleander, but you also get that great variegation in a plant. And these are generally anywhere from eight to 20 feet tall. So if you have large areas that you need to block off, but you want to look pretty, I think variegated oleander is an absolute uh, great plant to have. 
Uh, this was actually taken over by a hotel. This is Cassia Fistula. There's a bunch of different Cassia trees. Uh, this one is one of my favorites because I like how this one, the it actually looks like it's raining uh, golden flowers at that point. Uh, pretty good tree. They do tend to get a little brittle in hurricanes, but so does everything. Um, generally need staked a little bit longer. This is better than some of the other cassia trees that varieties I've seen that get a little bit top heavy, but I think these are great trees to use. Oops. There you go. Um, screw pines or pandanuses. These are really cool palms. Well, they're not palms. They're a monocot, but not a palm. Uh, these are great to use if you've ever had, you know, a palm tree die of Ganoderma, but you need something tropical to put in its place because you can't plant after Ganoderma, um, another palm in that area, and you don't want to do a hardwood. And they're just a really neat looking tree for something cool and tropical. This is a variegated one. I don't see these a lot, so I thought I would share this one. Uh, really cool tree. It is messy and it does have thorns, so don't put it on a pool deck. But again, outside of a pool deck, some areas, you will have leaves every day to pick up. It's worse than a large magnolia tree, but I think the look's so cool, it's worth it. If you have a community where you have, you know, people there daily for maintenance and for landscaping, it's a really cool tree. Uh, I don't think you can grow them in unprotected areas in central Florida, but along the coast, you definitely can. And very few pest problems. <clears throat> so here's a tree I saw when I was driving um, in Orlando. And I saw it, and on the other side of the street, I saw its cousin. I was like, wow, so here's these two trees, one completely unshaped. I mean, someone elevated this up and thinned it out like it looks like a tree. And this one, they kind of bald. The funny thing is, this is actually an invasive species. This is Brazilian pepper. And one thing to look out on for all of your properties, if you have Brazilian pepper, get it removed as soon as possible because it will spread everywhere. I mean, you could shape it into a hedge or make it look like a really nice tree like they did there, um, but you should remove them um, because they will spread and they are a very invasive species. Uh, those little black peppers there are carried out by birds and spread throughout the community. Uh, so it's a good idea when you see them to take care of them. These have obviously been there for a while and that's why they're so well maintained. Um, but it's not an actual tree, it's an invasive species. Uh, one of my favorite trees is the Geiger tree. Hates wet feet, but if you can find a good spot for a Geiger tree, it is an absolute great little tree to have. I prefer the white over the orange. I think the leaves on the white are a little bit nicer and I like the color of the white flower. But if you like orange, there's not a lot of orange colored trees out there. Um, I think the Geiger tree is a great and it's a small tree. It's not going to be something like an oak or anything like that. It's actually smaller than a tapabuya. Probably they like to be about 12 to 15 feet, 20 feet tall. And that's about it. So they're a nice, small, ornamental tree. Bottle brushes. Uh, there's two different types. Uh, there's the weeping bottle brush and then the standard bottle brush. You can kind of tell what they are because they're red and they have flowers like a bottle brush. Uh, they're related to the Maluka tree. That's an invasive species down south, but these are not invasive and they really can, you know, add some color and some pop to a community. Um, some people get them confused with powder puff trees and stuff like that, but the bottle bush tree is a great tree, not a fast grower, but really has a showy display of flowers when it does bloom. All right, now on the holly trees, because I've got a few minutes left and we're going to get into some tools for you guys. So holly trees get what's called the witch's room. Um, and you start to get twig die back and root rot and all sorts of things with them. Um, one thing with witch's broom, the only real way to deal with it is to sterilize every single cut that you make on the holly tree. And any of us that are, you know, dealing with HOAs, nobody has the budget to hand prune every single holly tree and disinfect every with every single cut. Um, so one of the things that I talk about with this, and the disease can spread, you know, through pruning, through our pruning tools, but also by the wind and rain. So we, even if you did all that, it could still spread by wind and rain, which we tend to get a lot of. And over the last couple of days, we've had some pretty nasty wind and rain. But here's some options for you with those. 
One is the Japanese blueberry, also known as Eleocarpus, that one on the left. I think that's a great shrub that can be an ornamental tree. It can be done in just about any shape, size, or whatever. Very few pest problems. Um, it's one of my favorites. I had one on the side of my garage when I lived in Deland. It was 14 foot tall. I cut it to a four foot stub and then maintained it at six feet. I mean, it's it's pretty much bulletproof. A little gem magnolias can also be a replacement for them. Weeping Yupon, if you want a little bit more of a different look. Uh, also Juniper Torlusas. Uh, one of my favorites is the mast tree, especially for use on the coast and over in uh, Southwest Florida area. The mast tree is like the tropical version of an Italian cypress without getting spider mites and dying and wondering why, what happened to it. Um, the mast tree is being planted quite a bit. It has a nice leaf to it too. The color's really nice. It stays kind of in that column form. I think it's a great tree for replacement of those types of um, trees. And you can use them in replacements of hollies and stuff like that also. So now we're gonna talk about some tools for you. So the University of, Ext University of Florida's Extension Service is the best thing and gonna be your best tool for any of your needs. Uh, with the U University of Florida Extension Service, you can search just about anything. But I'll tell you, really, being able to just Google, let's say you have pest on holly tree. If you put that in an IFAS, where you'll see up there at the top where it says University of Florida IFAS extension. If you just type in IFAS and then whatever question you have, whatever you're seeing in your landscape, it'll pull up all sorts of articles. It's a great resource for you know landscape committees and for CAMs. Another one is FloridaYards.org. This is where you can really find out about landscaping and some of your some of the plants and what their needs are. So if someone sends you a proposal and you want to know more about that plant, you can look it up here and you're going to get its optimal light range. You're going to see how much water it requires with the soil moisture. You're going to see whether it's native. You'll be able to tell whether it's drought tolerant or not, whether it's a perennial, whether it's in, an invasive. You'll get general comments. You'll get its growth rate, its mature height, mature spread, what type of soil texture it likes, and pH that likes, and whether it's salt hardy, hardy or not, um, and we're in the hardiness zone for cold weather range. It gives you so much information uh, just by using that website there. You can get it also on shrubs, things like Thrialis. You can, you know, find out whether something is native or not. You know, you can see this one can be in dry soils or wet soils or shade or, you know, slightly sunny, partially sunny or sun. I sound like a weatherman at that point. And, you know, whether it's a native or not. What's the website? I'm going to put it in the chat. Uh, FloridaYards.org. And then, you know, one of my favorite shrubs is actually wild coffee. You don't see it a lot, um, but wild coffee does great in shade and gets a little red coffee berries and has a great green glossy leaf. You also have that it's a native and, you know, native doesn't necessarily have to mean ugly. Um, it doesn't like getting really cold, so us uh, here in Central Florida, we're kind of out of luck. But, you know, up to about St. Pete area, it's really, and maybe up in Tampa, it's really nice uh, shrub to have. One of my favorite things of all is there's an app called Picture This Plant Identifier. And I know, oh, well, it's just for nerds, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it is. It's for absolute plant nerds. When I was at the ISA convention... A tree convention a few days back. Uh, we were there for three days doing training, right? We tested all sorts of different apps to see what was the best, and we had cuttings of plants and photos from our phone. I had to find a random shrub that I took a photo of at Animal Kingdom that none of my friends knew what it was. Google didn't know what it was. That was the only thing that ended up stomping this thing. Um, I go to Animal Kingdom almost on a weekly basis, and I try this out on all sorts of trees and shrubs, and I am shocked at how much it knows. I, I haven't stumped it yet, and I think outside that one shrub that I found, um, um, yeah, it, it's an amazing app. It can also tell you, depending on the photo, it can tell you whether there's something wrong with the plant or if it's having issues and things like that. So if you have a landscape committee that 
you know, always has questions and things like that, tell them to download this app. If you want to know anything about your property, any plant and what it is, this is the best thing to have. Um, it's also great, especially for everybody in Southwest Florida that, you know, in Central Florida, like I said, we have 10 plants. We do a lot of viburnum here, right? But down in South Florida, there's six or seven different varieties of jasmine, right? So when you're planting jasmine and replacing plants, you can be sure that you have the right one because you can take a photo of it and it'll tell you whether it's a downy jasmine or a star jasmine or a Gold Coast jasmine or a Lakeview jasmine. Like, it'll tell you the differences. Um, I think this thing's really cool and it's fun to stump people too. Um, I, I get stumped at Animal Kingdom, so I use this app to, you know, just be a complete plant nerd. Um, so hopefully you guys found some of this information interesting. This is my cat, Bentley. He's 19. Um, if you guys have any questions, let me know, and I would be happy to answer them. Very nice. I, my sister is going to love that app you just mentioned. I got to say Oh, that it's the me. best. She's a plant aficionado, man. She, she loves that stuff. Okay, guys, time for questions. Anybody have any? Now's the time. While you got him. Speak now or forever hold your speak now or forever hold your peace. We may have him at the next uh I don't know. I think we have another one with Juniper scheduled. I'm not sure. All right, guys. Well, if there's no questions at all, let's do our quick drawing to see who has won uh, Cindy's $25 gift card to local restaurant. It's one of those that has multiple restaurants on it. So I'm going to pull up the quick draw. Oh, what is the app called again? It's picture this dash plant identifier, right? Yep. If you just type in picture this all one word in Apple or Android, it'll say plant identifier. Don't get naturalists and the others are okay. Picture this is by far the best. All right. And quick draw. Lucky draws right now. I'm going to spin it. Spin. Courtney Dalton. You have won a $25 gift card, Courtney. Let me put your name right here so I can send it over to Sydney. To Cindy, I'm going to send Cindy your email address so that she can get in touch with you and make sure you get that. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. I know that this is not um, in your normal thing anymore. And we want to, um, re we really appreciate your knowledge. I'm, I think to me, John, you give one of the best CEU courses, especially when it comes to, you know, the landscaping industry. I am just like, you're my go-to guy. So um, I, I, hope, I do love I it. Can, I do love it. And so we can't get in touch with you anywhere anymore. Can we not for uh, right now? On, on LinkedIn? Sure. Um, I'm kind of, I have a drinking problem now, as you can tell behind me. Um, so I <laughs> before five it's generally yeah you can find me on linkedin and you know okay. i see i see people at events i still keep up with my cam ceus and stuff so i'll be around for the next little bit okay oh well you know what you have a you have your cam license yep well you could come on cam matrix and do your online classes here if you want to of course yeah, you're I giving most of them so yeah i sneak in some here and there okay <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Sherry said great information. Thank you. Everybody said thank you, thank you, thank you. And we appreciate uh, William said great class. Uh, we appreciate everyone for tuning in today. I uh, know you guys have a busy schedule. you got one more day left until the weekend, so you can do it. Happy Friday evening, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you guys soon and we'll see you at the next CEU class. And again, thank you to ACPLM for sponsoring today's webinar.